Hello and welcome to part three of our reading of the Magdalene Manuscript. If you missed part two and part one, I will put them down in the description box below. It's probably worth your time to listen to those two parts first before continuing with part three. Now, as I said last week, I want to remind everybody that this manuscript was channeled. And even though channeling is a beautiful, beautiful gift and a beautiful, beautiful asset for us to have here on these third density planets where we're so thick in the Prakriti that we have a thick veil between us and the spirit realm, it can't always be trusted. Now, there are things in this manuscript that I absolutely agree with. And there are things in this manuscript that I absolutely don't agree with. One of them being the crucifixion of Yahshua, or as we call him, Jesus. Now, this time last year, I absolutely believed that Yahshua was crucified. However, now I don't. And I have my own evidence to support that opinion. Our history has been completely morphed and changed in order to manipulate and trick us. Last week, I spoke about something called confirmation bias. And when we're channeling, sometimes that confirmation bias comes through. Regardless of whether you're channeling through a dowsing board or using the I Ching or using tarot cards, every single human being that's acting as the conduit, as the channeler, has their own ingrained confirmation bias with certain storylines and certain information. Sometimes this confirmation bias is subconscious, while other times it is very much conscious. And with this, I do believe that the channeler who channeled Mary Magdalene had the story of Yahshua being crucified so ingrained in his head from indoctrination from our matrix system that he actually thought that's what she was saying. But from what I found in my research, no such crucifixion happened. The reason being is that a human sacrifice is not something that our God, source creator, would ever demand of his creations. That's something Lucifer demands. And so it makes sense that the church, which is part of this deep state program, would change the story of Yahshua and of course change the story of Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, who in reality, was the feminine Christ. They came here for a thousand years in Tartaria to teach the Christ consciousness, the Kundalini, the rising of enlightenment within all of us. Because like Yahshua and Mary Magdalene, we are all children of God. Now, of course, I understand from my research that it is true that both Mary Magdalene and Yahshua were raised in the priest and priestess hood of Isis. They were not Hebrew. They were not Jewish. Although a lot of Yahshua's students and disciples were Jewish, he himself was not. So the channeled information here regarding the priestesshood of Isis is what I find truly fascinating because that does back the research into Mary Magdalene and Yahshua. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. We left off at section eight. So that is where we are going to pick up. I turn now to my beloved sister, my sister in spirit, the mother of Yahshua, also known as Mary. Mary was a high initiate in the cult of Isis, having received her training in Egypt. That is why when she and Joseph fled the king's wrath in Israel, they took flight into Egypt, for she had safety there among the priestesses and the priests of Isis. Her training was different than mine yet we served the same. In order for me to explain my understanding of Mary, I must explain one of the deepest secrets of the Isis cult. For it was believed, and I hold this to be true, that under certain conditions, the goddess herself would incarnate, either at birth or through spiritual initiation. Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she was quite young, was recognized for her purity of spirit by the great priestesses of the Isis temples. She was trained as an initiate and reached the highest levels. But rather than becoming a priestess, she was trained to become what is called an incarnate. To be an incarnate is to be very highly advanced soul and requires undergoing tremendous spiritual training and discipline. In a final initiation, Mary became the holder of the energy stream directly from Isis herself. In this regard, she was the embodiment of the cosmic 
mother. It is as if there were two, Mary, the human, pure of spirit and heart, holding within her a direct portal into the great mother, the creatrix of all matter, of all time and space. And that's one thing, too, we have found in the missing books of the Bible that we've started over a year ago, that in a lot of these missing books, when they refer to God, they don't refer to God as God the Father. They refer to God as God the Mother Father, or both the Divine Mother and the Divine Father, two and one. Again, this comes back to the balance of the Divine Feminine with the Divine Masculine. There has to be a balance between the two energies. There's a balance in our own bodies too. Me as a feminine, I also carry masculine energy and a masculine also carries feminine energy. We have have this through through the nostrils, the Ida and the Pingala, the left being the feminine and the right being the masculine. That is why if you get your nose pierced as a woman in the Eastern culture, you're always getting it pierced on the left because that is the feminine side. And so not only do souls that are twin flames, so a twin, again, just a reminder, according to Plato's Symposium and what we've seen in a lot of these old manuscripts, a twin flame, a soul is a soul basically that splits into two. Now, this soul is a really old soul, very been around for a very, very long time. And it has gathered so much understanding of its own consciousness that it has the ability to then split into two. And so what we call twin flames means that a soul has split into two, into a divine feminine and into a divine masculine. And so they incarnate into a woman and a man most of the time, generally speaking, sometimes it can be same sex, but just generally speaking, a man or a woman, both with the same soul. Now, again, as we've said before, as an, like I have a twin, um, A lot of people that come from the Lyran uh, starseed group have twins and um, it's not, it's not as romantic as people think it is. It's the twin flame journey is, is a hard one. It's kind of like puts your soul's lesson into hyperdrive uh, because part of your soul is literally in, in another person. But anyway, what the dark players have tried to do is create imbalance, disharmony, chaos, And so we know right now they're trying to keep twins apart because when twins work together, regardless of whether that's romantically or not, whatever their soul contract is, it ups the vibration because that soul is then coming together again as one. This is what we see with a lot of the, um, what, what they call sex magic in the ISIS religion is this idea of the twins coming together in a very intimate way. Now, of course, we know the bad guys have also manipulated that as well. And we know that vibrationally for Yahshua or Mary Magdalene as ascended masters themselves to come through the portal of the woman, then the parents of these two people themselves also had to be high vibrational people in order to host a soul like the Magdalene or like Yahshua. I hope that makes sense. It's all about the vibrational frequency that's happening. And so when she's talking about the cosmic mother here, she's again, tapping back into this idea that everything's a balance between the divine feminine and the divine masculine within your own sovereign individual self and also within these relationships. Thus, the table was set, so to speak, for the conception of a being of remarkable qualities who would become her son, Yahshua. When Mary underwent what the church refers to as immaculate conception, she was a witness to a a celestial and galactic insemination process. Now, this I don't agree with, and we've talked about this, but again, this would be confirmation bias because we've been told about the immaculation conception story over and over and over and over again. But immaculate conception, guys, that's satanic. That's what happens in these rituals where you summon in a demon and incubus or a succubus to basically R-A-P-E, a a woman in the hopes of impregnating her to create a demigod. Now, if we remember back to our studies on the Council of Nicaea, before the Council of Nicaea, Yahshua Jesus was not worshipped as a god. He was seen as an ascended master, as a human being, as a teacher. Rabbi means teacher. And even Yahshua himself you know, told people to love thy God with all thy heart, love God. He's just the messenger. 
And of course, the dark cult, Lucifer, wants to confuse that and have you worship mere humans instead of the creator. And so this is also where I think that there is some confirmation bias through the channeler. But let's continue. She was a witness to a celestial and galactic insemination process by which the father principle or spirit, as we understood this, and the Isis cult transferred his essence into Isis. The mother that receives the seed of the father, mother receiving the impulse of spirit, and this highly refined and potent spiritual energy took root in Mary's womb and gave birth to Yahshua. We know from other uh, historical accounts that Joseph was actually uh, Yahshua's father. Um, he was the, he impregnated Mary. And again, just like Mary Magdalene's parents, they were two priests and priestesses in this cult of Isis, as Mary Magdalene's parents were as well. And so if you think about that, if you think about the tantric side of, of intimacy, I'm trying to watch what I say so YouTube doesn't get upset, but the tantric side of intimacy, if you have two consenting people, especially people who marry each other, a divine feminine and a divine masculine engaged in this process of lovemaking and their vibration is high and they understand the spiritual implications of this act. So they understand spiritually what's happening. They are able to then through their own vibrations, create a space for a portal for a higher density spirit to come in an ascended master to come through. So I hope that's why I hope that makes sense. And that's why it's really important to understand that both Magdalene's parents and Yahshua's parents were high up in this religion, in this faith. Now, I've said this before through my research. I'm really, really, really curious about Mary Magdalene's mother. From what I understand, Mary Magdalene's mother was extremely powerful and from what I understand, she herself came from the Kentuckian, not Kentucky. I think people are getting confused about that. I'm not saying the state Kentucky. I'm saying Kentuckian. That's another planet. This is what we call Nordic people. The Kentuckians, kind of my features, would be very Kentuckian. And from what I understand, Mary's mother, Mary Magdalene's mother, was most likely Kentuckian through her parents. And from what I understand, her parents, Magdalene's maternal grandparents, were very powerful people too. Now, the interesting thing is, through my research, Mary Magdalene's father is mentioned in the canonized Bible. I think people are going to be pretty shocked when they find out who her father was. Her father was also very, very powerful. He was a governor of sorts. And um, if you guys know anything about these types of historical times, a lot of the priests and priestesses were also politicians. So both Mary Magdalene and Yahshua came from very, very powerful families. Yahshua was, was not a little poor boy, as they like to tell us, which doesn't matter anyway. He was still an ascended master, so it really doesn't matter what, whether he was born poor or not. He was not born poor, though. He was born to very wealthy parents, as was Magdalene. So I hope that's clear. Hopefully, as more time passes, this will become more understood by us collectively as a society. I think it's going to be really hard for the mainstream fundamentalists or evangelicals in our world to accept that the story they've been told is completely false. But on the other hand, the real story is really cool and really powerful. So this brings us to section nine. Mary was with the apostles when they came upon me at the well. She immediately recognized me as a fellow initiate by the gold serpent bracelet I wore on my arm and by the seal of Isis, which glowed within my Ka body. For Mary was quite clairvoyant and psychic. Now, from what I understand too, this might be a little bit off because from what I actually understand, Mary Magdalene and Yahshua grew up together. They were like initiated through different practices together their parents were friends and um i know that mary initiated uh yashua's ka body which again i think i mentioned this last time uh it is very common that the female is the one that initiates the male uh in all these different rituals most of which are intimate um but from what i understand especially in twin flame unions it's the woman that acts as the antenna um the body is her body is the gate, the portal. And when she is intimate with her twin, 
not just any man, but with her twin, she then activates him. Uh, he, he, I think he can activate by himself, but it's more powerful when the woman actually activates the man, which I know a lot of men who are fundamentalist or even evangelical are not, not going to want to hear that, that it's the woman that actually has the ability to, to do that through, through the Kundalini with her actual twin. Again, not just any man, but her actual twin that shares a soul with her, the divine masculine. I know that the divine feminine is also the one that will um, initiate tower moments for her counterpart's life to wake him up. It's fascinating. And there's, I have so many books on this guys, and we're going to go through more and more books about this because this is something that we information we've been robbed of intentionally, but you guys know what I'm saying. All right, let's continue. The first person whose eyes I met were those of Yahshua. And as I said, I felt transported into other worlds in his immense presence. The second person whose eyes I met were those of his mother. In her eyes was recognition and acknowledgement of my status as a fellow initiate within the Isis cult. And although her training had not been in sex magic as mine had been, she understood that I had been prepared for Yahshua. Yeah. I, so this might be TMI, but I've learned over the past few months that for women, we have to be like, trained and prepared for our twins like we have to, to do certain things uh certain exercises by ourselves in order to be ready to initiate our counterpart through intimacy so i know that sounds weird but just go with it between them i lifted up on the wings of transcendental love i felt my spirit soar Ironic, then, the next eyes I would see were those of Yahshua's disciplines who judged me as a whore, and countless generations have held me this way. But I say to you that in Yahshua's eyes and those of his mother, I was not a whore, but a clear vessel for the healing and nurturing powers of Isis herself. There comes a time in a man's life, where, whether human or divine, when his mother cannot give him the essence of what he needs. Her love continues. But what is required is sustenance from another woman. I was that woman. Mary recognized me in my status and passed her son to me in that moment by the well. Mary and I spent much time together, time in which we discussed Yahshua's work, his needs, and my place in his life. It was understood that I was a servant to a greater power. I had been trained for this, but I must tell you that the power of recognition still shakes me. I still tremble at his recognition. In those many nights and days together, Mary and I attended to the needs of Yahshua and his disciples. And in that period, Mary and I became very close, for I loved her and I love her still. For her physical beauty, the purity of her heart and spirit and gentleness in which she dealt the world. I can say from my own clarity that Mary, having served as the vessel for Isis, is an incarnate, was a highly developed master. But now having served in these ways, her mastery and perfection her spiritual perfection is staggering. Section 10. She exists within the heavenly realms, her compassion and love continually, continually flowing to all humans. She is available to all, regardless of their beliefs. When someone calls upon her, know that they are heard. I wish now to clarify my understandings. I wish to speak about the sex magic of Isis and the cult and the alchemies of Horus. I wish to reveal secrets that an initiate would never have revealed, even under the threat of death. But the times are different now. Time, as you know, it is running out, and I have received permission from the goddess herself. Indeed, I have been asked by the goddess herself to reveal to you some of the most closely guarded secrets of all time. These are revealed to you in hopes that you will elevate yourselves in time. 11. The alchemies of Horus refer to a body of knowledge and methods for the alternation of the Ka body. In this understanding, as the Ka embodies or acquires greater energy and light, there is an increase in one's magnetic field, in that which the initiate desires becomes more quickly manifested. However, in surrender to one's own celestial soul or the Ba, the pursuit of personal desires, although not abandoned, is no longer the focus of one's entire existence. 
Instead, one looks upward, so to speak, to the higher capabilities of oneself as perceived through the Ba or the celestial soul. The celestial soul or Ba exists within a much higher level of vibration in the physical body, the Kat or the Ka, the spiritual or etheric twin to the physical form. Within the Ka body, there are pathways that can be stimulated and opened. The activation of these secret passages within the Ka bring it much greater power. The alchemies of Horus are designed to strengthen these, to activate the latent powers and abilities of the initiate through what is called Jed, or the Ascended Seven Seals, or what the yogis of India call chakras. Yes. It's so funny. So I was speaking with Stephanie um, off air one day. We were doing some pulling cards. And um, I know we've talked about it on air before. I, I very much know that I was a part of this ISIS faith at one point. I actually know more about my story than I've mentioned on air. I have a very close connection to Mary Magdalene. Very, very close connection to her. As most of you know, because you guys see her standing around me all the time. Um, and it... it became apparent to me as we know we all have soul contracts and even though we don't want to repeat patterns from past lives because that's a samskara and that becomes like a broken record we don't grow when we repeat past lives but we can mirror them and i know that from everything i've been through in these last five months i was forced to really sit down and look at some stuff and go into the quantum and, and look at everything and so regardless of how hard these past five months have been, it has given me that gift to understand more about where I come from. And yeah, I, I was a part of this ISIS um, religion, heavily involved in this ISIS religion. And it makes sense because this life karmically for all of us is mirroring that life. Instead, this time we're going to be taking a different path. We will be the ones to be victorious, not the dark ones, but us. And um, the school that I attended in India, where I'm authorized now to teach, I'm the only female in the state of Georgia who's authorized to teach this form of yoga. It's a very, very hard school to get into. And I've never had problems. When I first applied, I got in right away. And on top of that, Sanskrit came pretty naturally to me. And the philosophy itself became very natural when I started to really dive into the philosophy. All of a sudden, I just kind of knew it. Like, I already knew it. And a lot of people, I see a lot of colleagues when I'm back in India in classes who really have a hard time understanding basically what she just said here about the idea of what we, what we say in, in Sanskrit and yoga is Purusha Prakriti and Ishvara. You know, Prakriti is nature. It's, it's, it's the, the lower part of the soul where we have also have Atman, which is the inner, real inner soul. And so that's what she's saying here. And yes, the chakras and sinus centers are these energy points that go up Shashumna, which is where the kundalini rises through or the Christ consciousness rises through at the base of the sacrum, at the bowl of the pelvis. This is why we practice things like mulabandha in yoga. This is why I've been talking a lot about doing exercises to uh, unstick the hips, to unstick the pelvic floor, especially for women. Because here in our time period, women have been shamed for this kind of stuff. And it's time that we unstick that emotional bondage over that area of our body, which I believe that the dark ones did intentionally, especially knowing what I know now that it's women who initiate it's women who are the ones that initiate the men. How can the men be initiated if the women are stuck in their pelvic floor? So anyway, all right, we go on to section 12. Within the school in which I was trained, we learn how to activate the serpent power, moving it in specific paths in the spinal column and opening up the circuits within the brain. This created what is called uraeus. Yes, I just spoke about this. The spinal, the serpent power is kundalini. Now, of course, the dark ones have manipulated the serpent. The serpent, nothing. I want to say this again. I've said this so many times. Darkness can't create anything. Darkness can't create jack shit, nothing, right? It's the light that creates. I mean, think of just simple photosynthesis. It's the light that creates. And so everything we see in this world, whether we think it's bad or whether we think it's good, was originally created by the light. Pyramids, serpents, even the pentagram that we think is so bad was created by God. 
was created by the light. And it was the darkness who took these things, these tools, and inverted them to make them evil. Same thing with the planet of Saturn. We've talked about the brotherhood, the Saturnalian brotherhood, which is where we get the word Satan from. And I think you guys probably remember where Taylor Moon even spoke about a channeling where Saturn came through and Saturn felt like he had been R-A-P-E-D because the dark players had manipulated the purpose of Saturn. Saturn was also created by God. Saturn represents the matrix, the living and breathing everyday things we have to do like cook, go to work and pay bills. That's Saturn. Saturn's also father time, something we're all slave to. But Saturn got manipulated, just like everything that this dark cold has done. And so we have to release these ideas that things like the serpent, things like Kundalini, things like pyramids are bad. They're not. They were created by God, too. And because they were created with a powerful purpose by God, we're going to take them back. And we're going to cleanse them and make them whole again. Return them to their original form. And so the serpent power she's speaking is kundalini, is the Christ consciousness. We know that kundalini, as I've said in many, many episodes, kundalini lies right at the base of the stomach. So right here in that pelvic floor, that's why it's important to learn how to move the hips, really move them, feel this, the, the, the femur in the socket, learn how to rotate and move. Because this right here is where kundalini lies. And it curls up like a little snake, a sleeping snake at the bottom of the, the pelvic floor, this base right here where the, the hip bones are, and it comes down into that base. And once we start to move this, once we start to clear this, and I myself do this through physical practices and exercises, that snake starts to move. And all of a sudden, the snake will start to rise up through the spine. Now, of course, it has to hit all of those energy points, the chakra centers, before it can actually come up into the celestial part, the seventh chakra. We have the sixth one here. Um, and it doesn't sometimes happen at once. It, it, it happens over time. I mean, I was speaking about the other day about prativa, which is a Sanskrit word that means a flash of illumination. And a lot of times what happens to us in our life, especially those of us who have been really working, I mean, I've spent the past 15 years actively working on finding enlightenment, actively working on healing myself and learning the full depth of who I am. I've been very lucky that way. And as I said, I think that was, I've done that in this life because I did this in this past life as well. And I think I, it was necessary for me to go back and, and do this again. But we have these moments, you know, samadhi, the word samadhi means union with God, oneness with God. And we're ultimately looking for samadhi with the capital, with capital S, right? But over time, we have these moments of pratibha, these flashes of illumination with the lowercase s, where all of a sudden we see things clearly, but then we sink back down into our, our human form. This itself is also why, also ding, 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 why twin flames don't meet each other until later in life, until later in life. You don't meet your twin as a kid. Your twin is not your high school sweetheart. You don't meet your twin in college. You probably don't even meet your twin in your late 20s, early 30s. Most of the time, it's in your late 30s, 40s, and 50s that you meet your twin. This is because of this, of this idea of an initiation. You and both of you, both the masculine and the feminine, have to go through their own work before meeting their twin. For me and my story, I had to go through the dark night of the soul all those years in India, breaking myself, learning how to do all of the things I learned how to do in order to then be available to initiate my twin, if that ever came a possibility. Likewise, the masculine, like Yahshua, had to also go through his own understanding so that the initiation could be accepted, so that the antenna could actually be activated. It, it makes sense, right? Like, it's kind of like common sense. It's like you're training. Like, it's like an athlete that trains for a competition, you know? It, but I want to also make it clear, too, that sometimes... From what I understand, the activation doesn't just happen in like one night. You know, it, it could take a long time of 
intimacy with the, the two to actually reach the full activation. But from what I understand that the minute you are intimate with your twin, it changes everything. Like it's a, it's an immediate like connection, but anyway. All right. I know that's going to probably ruffle some feathers, especially for people who are very religious, but I just ask that you have an open mind and just, you know, as Aristotle said, it's the sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. So just entertain it right now. It's, it's a fun topic to talk about. It's, it's, I love philosophy anyway, so I could talk about this all day. All right, so let's continue with section 12. The Uranus is often a blue fire that extends up the spine, both laterally and horizontally and into the brain. And it undulates with the change in energy within these pathways. The activation of this increases the brain's potential for intelligence, creativity and most importantly recepted for the task of the initiate to change the quality of one's beings so that the attunement to the ba our celestial soul is clear and unobstructed section 13 when i met yashua by the well for the first time the mere proximity of his presence activated my internal alchemies a serpent power moved up my spine as if i had practiced the disciplines i had learned the first night when we were alone together arm in arm lying next to each other we practiced the sexual magic of isis this specific form of magic charges the ka body with tremendous magnetic force through the power of physical orgasm for when one has a sexual orgasm, there is a tremendous release of magnetic energy within the cells. As this energy spreads, it releases a magnetic potential that can be used, the vibrational quality that I was talking about. I wish to share the specifics of this, but in order to do so, I must explain more of the basic understanding of sex and spiritual realization where this secret was stolen by the church. All right, guys, I think we're going to leave it there on a cliffhanger just because I want to take this in small chunks because I do know that this stuff is quite new for a lot of people. And um, and so I want people just to have time to kind of like integrate all of that into their mind and have I had a professor in college that used to say, go have a little think, go have a little think. So just go have a little think about that. Um, and also for women out there to kind of take that power back. Uh, that power that's been um, taken from us by the powers that be, that we are only pure if we follow a certain strategic plan of action when it comes to intimacy. But from what we're learning from the two Christ is that's not true. And for women out there that do have a twin, you hold you, you, you are the antenna that holds the key to your twin's activation. And so that's some that's a that's a great power to have. And with, as Spider Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. Or as the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is expected. So.